<laughs> okay, so yes, uh, we've got a few spare handouts at the front. Uh, this Friday uh, is when you get a chance to do the uh, official student evaluation of teaching and student evaluation and modules um, using the university's evaluate system. And I'll give you some time to do this on the day um, between the lecture and the workshop. So that'll be a chance, and you can use your mobile devices on the spot. I'll be sending you out more information about that. Um, if you decide, uh, you only get a chance to do it once, but if you do not have a mobile device with you, or um, you prefer to do it later, you can. Um, the, the student evaluation of teaching, that's SET, that stays open for 24 hours once it's started. Um, so that starts on Friday and you get 24 hours. And uh, you get seven days to do the student evaluation of modules, which is officially different from student evaluation of teaching. Okay. Um, uh, what else is there? Oh, yes. So don't forget uh, the, the uh, class test today at 5 o'clock. So hopefully as many of you as possible will come to that even though it doesn't contribute to the uh, actual module mark, it's still going to be very good practice for you, uh, first of all, at the kind of thinking you have to do in this module, and secondly, uh, keep you in practice at doing class tests, because you will have to do class tests in, other, in the other modules through the year. And, oh yes, there's some coursework you're probably as well, isn't there? So, yes, sir. Uh, Any, uh, there seems to be a certain amount of noise, yes? Yeah, and how does the class test go up to, like, the chapter goes up to, um, not last week, but the week before. Okay? Um, so everything up to the end of the week before last. So it doesn't cover the, uh, so there won't be the stuff on the permutations this time. Um, but everything before permutations is included. Right, so cardinality of a finite set, that was just the number of elements in it, um, which includes the possibility of naught if your set is empty. Um, the empty set is the only set whose cardinality is zero. Of course, there's no end of sets with one element in. Um, in fact, there are more sets with one element in than there are sets. Uh, that, that can't be right, but uh, it's still, it somehow, uh, let, let me say that again. There are more sets with one element in than you can put in any one set. So the set of things with just one element is, is too big. So what we want to look now is an introduction to the fact that there's more than one kind of infinity as well. So you might have thought it goes no elements for the empty set, then there's sets with finitely many elements and you count them, and then there's sets with infinitely many elements. But amongst the sets of infinitely many elements, we're going to see various different types. In this module, we're going to concentrate on two different kinds of infinity, uh, the countably infinite sets and the uncountably infinite sets. Uh, so, countable does not mean finite in this module. In fact, it doesn't ever mean that you have to be finite. Finite sets will be, for us, special kinds of countable sets, but the more interesting countable sets are the ones which are what we're going to call countably infinite. These are things like the natural numbers, which, uh, which is our which is our main example of what's called a countably infinite set because it's got the elements 1, 2, 3, 4. There's no end to them, but at least you've just got one for each positive integer. Um, and 
that's going to be an example of a countably infinite set, but we're going to see quite a lot of other countably infinite sets, and then we're going to see that there are some sets that are even bigger, namely things like the set of real numbers, which is bigger than that. And those are the sets which have got more than a bigger infinity than just a countably infinite. They're going to be the uncountably infinite sets. And um, if you want to know more about that, you might want to look at my uh, video called Beyond Infinity, which you can find on YouTube um, or various other places via my blog, for example. And you could also look up the continuum hypothesis if you're interested, um, which is also about different kinds of infinity. Uh, right, so, so let's see what it means for two sets to have the same cardinality. Well, for finite sets, we know really that's, that comes from there being a bijection between the two sets. That's one way of saying they've got the same number of elements. And we're going to use that for infinite sets as well. Two sets will have the same cardinality if there is a bijection between them. So we say, if you've got two sets, A and B, then A has the same cardinality as B if there's a bijection from A to B. And uh, that makes sense for finite sets. Um, of course, the empty set is a slight nuisance um, because, uh, well, the empty set has the same cardinality as the empty set, which means there should be a bijection from the empty set to the empty set, and there is. You have to use the empty function, though. Uh, I'll leave you to think about that. The empty set is always a nuisance. Um, but apart from the empty set, um, things are pretty much what you expect. So, let's have a look and see. This is a bit like an equivalence relation, having the same cardinality. Every set is the same cardinality as itself because there's the identity map from A goes to A. That's, uh, that's the one that sends x to itself for all x in A, if any. And uh, that's definitely a bijection. Um, so certainly sets have the same cardinality as themselves. That's a good start. Then if A has the same cardinality as B, then B has the same cardinality as A, well... If A has the same cardinality as B, then there's a bijection from A to B. So if F from A to B is a bijection, then F to the minus 1 from B to A is also a bijection. Um, so, except for the fact that this, you can't have a set of all sets, this is pretty much saying, all this is pretty much saying that having the same cardinality is um, an equivalence relation. Um, because, okay, so you're related to yourself, you have the same cardinality as yourself. Um, and if A has the same cardinality as B, then B has the same cardinality as A. So this is symmetry here. Uh, this one's transitivity, which you do by composing bijections. Um, so, if F from A to B is a bijection, and G from B to C are bijections, uh, then, so you've got A goes to B, goes to C, <coughs> F going from A to B, G going from B to C, uh, then you can compose... Uh, G composed of F will take you from A to C and still be a bijection. So this is behaving reasonably well. Um, one thing you have to watch out for is it's a, if there is a bijection. That doesn't mean that the first function you try has to be a bijection because you might find... You know, generally, you'll, you'll find quite a lot of different functions from one set to the other, and maybe some of them are bijections and some of them aren't. Um, and you only have to find one that is a bijection out of all the things you try. You just have to find one that is a bijection, and then they've got the same cardinality. Um, it's different from finite sets, because uh, with finite sets, if they've got the same cardinality, then 
Well, if you manage to find an injection, it's automatically, if they're the same size, then it's hard to fail. When you, you look for something, that, you've got two sets that do have the same cardinality, and you try any injection from one set to the other, it's guaranteed to buy a bijection. And any surjection you try between them is guaranteed to a bijection. But if you're dealing with infinite sets, um, even if they have got the same cardinality, you may well find some injections that aren't surjections, and you may well find some surjections that aren't injections, and it may take you a while before you can actually find a bijection. Um, but we're going to see that that's not... Um, we're going to see in some, in some cases where this isn't an obstacle to figuring out what the cardinality is. Um, again, various ways of saving time. Okay. So now I can talk to you about countable sets and uncountable sets. And uh, in the literature, there's not universal agreement about what set is a countable set because not everybody, uh, uh, not everybody agrees about what to do with the finite sets. But everybody agrees about what to do about the countably infinite sets. So there's no disagreement about countably infinite. A, set, a countably infinite set is a set with infinitely many elements that has the same cardinality as the natural numbers. Um, since the natural numbers is an infinite set, the only, uh, you have to be an infinite set before you've got any chance of having the same cardinality as the natural numbers anyway. So a countably infinite set is one with the same cardinality as the natural numbers, which we already know includes the natural numbers. So the natural numbers is definitely countably infinite. So I'll just start by, in particular, <laughs> n, is, the natural numbers is countably infinite. Now, for us, and at Nottingham, I'd say, and Cambridge as well, I think perhaps this is in the majority, but it depends on, on where you look, um, a countable set could be finite, or it can be infinite if it's countably infinite. So a countable set for us is one which is either finite or it's countably infinite. So the really annoying one is that the empty set counts as countable um, because the empty set spoils a lot of the things that would otherwise be easy to deal with. It means that we have to keep saying, except for the empty set, and we can't do much about it. Um, but uh, for our perspective, we want to... Uh, it is a real nuisance if you couldn't say that every subset of a countable set is countable. And... Um, and this is, this is the standard statement. Every subset of a countable set turns out to be countable. But the empty set is a subset of, the, of countable sets. The empty set is a subset of everything. So unless you want to say every subset except for the empty... Every, you could say every non-empty subset of a countable set is countable, um, and that would get you around that one. But uh, we prefer to just say every subset of a countable set is countable. Right. Which we'll cover later anyway. So the alternative uh, is to be uncountable which means that you're not countable. Um, so, so you could stop there. This is already a correct definition. Um, uh, right, so I'm talking about, I think for the last two years, um, definition the definition of countable and uncountable has come up. Um, I think people were a bit better on it last year than they were the year before. Um, so two years ago, a lot of people were saying countable, countable meant finite. Um, that's not true. The natural numbers counts as a countable set. N is countably infinite. N is also countable, because countable means finite or countably infinite. So the natural numbers... N is countable, uh, the empty set is countable, um, 1, 3, 5 is also countable. So here are some examples of countable sets that illustrate three different types. The empty set is countable is a bit of a nuisance. Um, here's a set with three elements. 
That's countable because countable means finite or countably infinite. But countable also includes these countably infinite sets. So the natural numbers is countable. And uh, if you think that countable means finite, then that will be a problem because there's definitely infinitely many elements in the natural numbers. <coughs> so don't forget the natural numbers is countable. Um, otherwise, um, you may find yourself writing nonsense if you're ever asked to define countable. If you think that a countable set has to be finite, then uh, you're going to be in trouble on this bit if this turns up in the exam. All right. Okay, uncountable means not countable. Um, that's because that eliminates the finite sets, it eliminates the empty set, and it eliminates all the infinite sets with the same cardinality as the natural numbers. So it means it's a bigger kind of infinite. We haven't shown there are any yet, but that's coming later. Okay, so so far we do know about some countable sets, and we don't yet know that there's some uncountable sets, but we're going to prove that the set of real numbers is uncountable later. So here you are. Finite sets do count as being countable, even though they don't have the same cardinality as the natural numbers. The natural numbers is countably infinite, and we're going to see in a minute that Z, the all integers, and even the set of all rationals, and quite a lot of other sets, are countably infinite. But, so, to move beyond countable, you have to go to something really uh, a bit more significant, like... Um, the real numbers itself or non-degenerate intervals in the real numbers, um, like the open interval 0, 1. We're going to prove that the open interval 0, 1 is uncountable, and then any bigger set has to be uncountable as well, um, so we'll get that the real numbers is uncountable too, that way. Um, now, to give us a way in, um, because people quite like sequences, we're going to have a look at what this all means in terms of sequences, um, you never have to do it in terms of sequences. You can do it all with functions, but sequences some, uh, are quite intuitive. And so we're going to have a look at what's the connection between sequences and functions. And then once we've done that, we could look at what a bijection means in terms of sequences. So first of all, here's my notation for sequences. Um, my sequences will, unless I say otherwise, my sequences start with their first term being x1. Um, in some other modules, you could be allowed to start your sequences at some other term and not necessarily start with term 1. And if you're doing a power series, your first coefficient will normally be sort of a0. So it's quite common to start from 0. Um, if I'm starting from 0, I'll tell you. Um, usually I'll start from 1. So, I'll do, so you could say x1, x2, x3, dot, dot, dot. Um, Here's an abbreviation for it. I could write xn in brackets where n runs from 1 to infinity. That doesn't mean there's an infinity of term. This is just as usual, like if you're doing a series, like if you're doing a union. This just means there's one for every natural number, one for every positive integer. Um, but saying that it runs from n equals 1 to infinity just means that you don't stop, right? Um, but it doesn't mean there's a term x infinity. So there isn't one of those. And... Uh, and I normally just write it xn to save as much time as possible. Right. So xn in brackets just means it's a sequence x1, x2, x3, one for every positive integer. And again, a sequence is not a set. If you've got a sequence, you can write down a set which has the elements of the sequence in, but the set loses track of what order they were in. Okay, because the, the sequence could be any old thing. No, not, the sequence itself didn't have to be an increasing or it didn't have to be real numbers even. And so if they were real numbers, they didn't have to be an increasing or decreasing order or anything like that. Um, but they still know which order you mentioned them in. X1, X2, X3, they come, they, give, they come with a given order. And it might be one, a half, two, a quarter, four, some weird sequence like that. Um, and you know what the nth term is. Whereas if you put them all into a set, the set doesn't know which order you mention them in. Um, the set is the set, whatever it is. Um, just like you could have repeats in a sequence, but if you make a set out of it, the set only counts every element once. So uh, there are slight differences there. Nevertheless, we can write... Um, <coughs> we use subset notation as a shorthand. It just means if I write sequence xn, subset or equal x... 
this is just notational abbreviation meaning that xn is a sequence of elements of x, which means that I've got x1, x2, x3 in x. So it's just an abbreviation. But just like we used to ask what is a function, what is a relation, you can ask what is a sequence. Um, and if someone says what is a sequence, well, it's an infinite list, then someone says what's a list? Well, you can write it down, x1, x2, x3, but that doesn't sound very mathematical somehow. Um, so if you want a slightly more pure mathematical approach, um, you can say that a sequence actually is a function from the natural numbers to x. So a sequence of elements of x means a function from the natural numbers to x. And the relevant function um, takes 1 to x1, 2 to x2, 3 to x3, and so on. Um, if you've got a function from the natural numbers to x, then it will give you a sequence of elements of x. And if you've got a sequence of elements of x, you can make a function this way. And so you get a bijection between the sequences of elements of x and the functions from the natural numbers to x. And I don't mind which way you think of it. Okay. So if we're going to think of sequences of functions, then all our previous definitions in about what functions do can be interpreted in terms of sequences. Oh, let me uh, just write down, given f from natural numbers to x, how would you get the sequence? You can form the sequence f of 1, f of 2, f of 3. So that's how you get from a function to the sequence, and this is how you get from the sequence to the function, and it, it gives you a bijection between the sequences of elements of x and the functions of the natural numbers to x. <coughs> so if we're going to regard sequences in x as the same thing as functions of the natural numbers to x, an injection means you shouldn't have repeats in the sequence because two different natural numbers, if it's an injection, two different natural numbers should not be taken to the same thing in x. So when we look at this, regarding the function from the natural numbers to x, an injection means no two of these values should be the same. We shouldn't have f of 2 equals f of 4. We shouldn't have f of 5 equals f of 10 or anything like that. That means no element of x should appear more than once in the sequence xn. So there shouldn't be any repeats in the terms. A surjection means that you should be able to find all elements of x somewhere in the sequence at least once. So every element of x should appear at least once in the sequence xn. So we look at this again. If this function from the natural numbers to x is to be a surjection, then the image should be x. But the image of the function is a set of values, f of 1, f of 2, f of 3, which is basically the set of all the terms of the sequence. So as I said, you can take the sequence and make a set of terms out of it, x1, x2, x3, um, and that's going to be a subset of x. And the question is, is everything in x in there or not? Um, so if you're talking about a surjection, then everything in x should appear at least once in the sequence. <coughs> and a bijection you have to be an injection and a surjection, which means that everything in X should turn up exactly once in the sequence. So that's a sequence of elements of X of a very special kind, if you can find one at all, where every element of X appears exactly once in the sequence. Now these sequences have to be genuine sequences, and I'm going to show you some warnings about that in a minute. right? But if we work this way, what does it mean for a set to be infinite? Um, an infinite set, that's one where there's an injection for the natural numbers to x. So that would mean you have to be able to find a sequence of distinct elements of x. That's an injection for the natural numbers in terms of sequences. Right? And count to be infinite means that you should be able to find a sequence. You need a bijection from the natural numbers You want a bijection from the natural numbers to n, uh, from, to x. And a bijection from the natural numbers to x um, 
That's, as I said, a sequence where everything in X turns up exactly once in that sequence. For example, we're going to do Z. You have to be a bit careful with Z. Okay, I want to find a sequence of integers in which every integer appears exactly once. So here's the wrong. Wrong would be to try 1, 2, 3, 4, and then try to put 0, minus 1, minus 2 afterwards. What's wrong with this? Why doesn't this work? Yes? Doesn't go towards zero. Um, okay, but it's not required to go towards zero. Um, I mean, the sequence doesn't have to tend to zero. The zero does have to be in the sequence somewhere. Any, uh, can anyone see an objection to calling this a sequence? Okay, so the, there is a problem with this, is that what are the terms of the sequence? Well, the first term is 1, the second term of the sequence is 2, the third term is 3, so I have to ask you, which term of the sequence is naught? Okay, well, it does appear to be the infinity plus 1, um, and there isn't an infinity plus 1 term in a sequence. Every se you have to get to everything at a finite time, so I need a sequence so you never get to 0. The sequence never gets to zero. So for which n in the natural numbers is xn equal to zero, right? If there is in your sequence, you should be able to answer this question. Um, no, it, it may not be, it may be easy or difficult to answer this question, but you can see here that something has gone wrong because it isn't a natural number n where xn equals zero. If this is your sequence xn, right, suppose this is your sequence xn, we've used them all up already with the positive integers. x1 is 1, x2 is 2, x3 is 3. We've already used up all of the xn, and we've only, when we used up all the xn, we've only managed to do the positive integers, and we never made it to naught. So that's wrong. So what should we do? There's lots of ways of doing it, but we need a sequence that gets to each particular one at a finite point. Does anyone have a suggestion for a sequence that will correctly handle Z, yeah? Um, uh, naught minus one. Yeah. One. Yeah. Yeah. This is what I call the zipper system for traffic, right? Let's see if I've got that right. Minus 1, 1, minus 2, 2, minus 3, 3, minus 4, 4. Okay, so look at that sequence. It's a zipper system for traffic because you see you've got positive integers and negative integers as your two strings of traffic, and they both got to be dealt with. Um, and it's not fair to let um, the entire set of people... Uh, you can't let all the positive integers go first and then do the negative integers, or the negative integer stream of traffic never gets a look in. You never get there. So you do the zipper system instead... Um, and you can see that if someone says, how, when do I get to the million, uh, when do I get to the number minus a million, you get there at term about two million, give or take one. And where do I get to the term plus a million, it's about the same place. Um, so if someone gave you an integer, positive or negative, you'd be able to tell them which term gave you that integer. And you can see that every integer turns up exactly once in this sequence. <coughs> So I, uh, I say that it is clear every integer appears exactly once in this sequence. So that gives you Z is countable. It's countably infinite, in fact.
Uh, I will point out again, I'll remind you, infinite sets can be countable. This is a countably infinite set, so Z is countable. <coughs> We're going to see a lot of other sets can be countable as well um, before we finally see in the next lecture that there are some uncountable ones. Are there any questions about the wrong sequence that wasn't a sequence and the right sequence? Because we're going to see a few more wrong things and right things before we're done. So uh, do have a think about that. And if you've got any questions, do let me know. This is the last topic in the module, and it's probably one of the hardest topics in the module, but it does always get represented on the exam. Um, there's always something on countability and uncountability in the exam, so uh, unless you want to cut yourself off from that bit of the exam, you do need to try to understand this. So, finite sets count as countable, even though they're not countably infinite. The empty set is a nuisance, as I said before. Now, the following is very useful for non-empty sets, um, because it deals with the non-empty finite sets and the countably infinite sets at the same time. And you can think of this in terms of surjections from natural numbers instead of bijections, or... You can do it in terms of sequences. Okay, so I'm going to sketch the reasoning for this one. So, unfortunately, it has to be non empty. The empty set, this doesn't work because um, there's no surjection from the natural number to the empty set. In fact, there's no functions from a non-empty set to the empty set. It's a nuisance. Even the empty function is not available um, because you have to find, uh, if you're going from a non-empty set to the empty set, you have to find some values and there aren't any. So the empty set is, as I said, a nuisance. Uh, but for non-empty sets, um, X is countable if and only if there's a surjection from the natural numbers to the set. Okay, so morally speaking then, um, if you find a surjection from one set to another, the second set can't be bigger than the first one. So that's loosely speaking, says that if you find a surjection for the natural numbers to a set, that set can't be bigger than the natural numbers. Um, and if it's not bigger than the natural numbers, then you could do it. And that's roughly speaking what's going on. Um, in the other direction, um, you can come back using injections, and we'll mention that later as well. So uh, the nice thing about the injections is that does work for the empty set. So, in fact, a set is countable if and only if there's an injection from the set into the natural numbers. And even the empty set has one of those because the empty function is an injection. Um, it's just a rather silly one. Uh, so, so, the interesting thing is that the, in, the one with injections works and the empty set's okay. The one with surjections can't handle the empty set, which is a shame. Um, and let, well, you could do it slightly differently. Uh, right. In terms of sequences, then, um, remember, a surjection for the natural numbers to x, that meant a sequence in which every element of x appeared at least once. Okay. So let's sketch the proof of this and think about the difference between the old one. Okay, so um, let x be a non-empty set. So it's a sketch proof. So you let x be a non-empty set. Let's first suppose that x is countable. This is the easy way around. Um, case one is x is countably infinite. Uh, I'll do the sequence approach here, but you could do the 
uh, the function from natural numbers if you want, but since I'm promising it in terms of sequences, I'll do the sequence version. Then there is a sequence xn contained in x, such that every element of x appears exactly once in the sequence. Okay, every element of X appears exactly once in the sequence. Well, if it appears exactly once, then it certainly appears at least once. And we wanted it to appear at least once, so we managed that. Um, it's better to appear exactly once than at least once. So uh, this sequence satisfies the required conditions. Okay, so we've managed to get a sequence of everything at least once. Alternatively, we could have said there's a bijection for the natural numbers, and a bijection is always a surjection, so there's a surjection for the natural numbers. So you could say, or um, let f from the natural numbers to x be a bijection, then f is also a surjection. Okay, so bijections are surjections, those surjections don't have to be bijections. Okay? Otherwise, x is non empty and finite. So, case two, we didn't remember we said that x was non empty. This whole thing only works for non empty sets. So, case two is that x is non empty and finite. say x is equal to a1, a2 up to some am. And now I want a sequence that includes every element in x at least once. But I want an infinite sequence. So I have to decide what do I do once I've used the elements up. So x1 equals a1, x2 equals a2, and so on. xm equals am, but I need to decide what to do with the rest of my x's, but it doesn't matter. I've already used up everything in x, so I can do anything I like. And xn could be equal to am for all n greater or equal to m. Okay? And then, but you could, the alternative is you could go through them all again and again and again. It doesn't matter. So you could do, you could cycle through A1, A2 up to AM and then start again at A1. It doesn't make any difference. You've already used them all up. Then XN is, oh, XN is a sequence in X. And every element of X appears at least once in the sequence. For this particular choice, 
Most of them appear exactly once, but I've repeated the last one infinitely often. Um, but uh, it doesn't really matter, okay? So the converse Suppose there's a sequence, suppose there's a surjection with a natural number, suppose there's a sequence where everything appears at least once. It takes a long time to write that, um, so I'm going to give you a terminology you're allowed to use. Um, I'll say such a sequence uses up x. This doesn't seem to be an official term, but Professor Langley's used it in the past and uh, I've been using it. It takes such a long time to write the other thing, okay? So if you just want to say a sequence of elements, a sequence in X that uses up X, that means everything in X appears at least once, okay? Um, and there doesn't seem to be a good term for it. Um, oh, I still need more room. So the idea is, um, well, case one, again, is this time case one is that x is finite. In that case, I'm trying to prove that x is countable. If x is finite, then x is countable. <laughs> That's fine. That's good. So that case is dealt with. Otherwise, x is an infinite set, and you can do the following thing. So you look at x1, x2, x3. This thing uses up x, but there might be repeats. You form a new sequence. Yn. By deleting repeated terms. What I mean is you keep them the first time so you keep x1 because you haven't had any repeats yet. If x2 is the same as x1 you throw it out and you move on to x3. You delete anything that's repeated and this gives you a sequence in which everything in X appears exactly once. Uh, if, if X was a finite set and you did this, um, then you wouldn't get a genuine infinite sequence out of it because, in fact, by the time you'd finished, you'd have a finite <coughs> sequence that stopped. Um, that's why I dealt with the finite case first. Um, if it's an infinite set, then of course there will still be infinitely many different terms left by the time you've done this. So you just strike out anything that you've seen before and you've still got a sequence, only this time you don't have any repeats. And that's how you get from a sequence with repeats to a sequence without repeats. But I won't say any more about that. Uh, right, then, I think I'm going to have to come back and finish this on Friday, the proof that a union of two countable sets is countable. So I'll come back and prove that on Friday um, because we're out of time today.